research that we've done that we've talked about today, the serpentine wear section in, at Bonneville Dam are an issue. And so part of what we've been doing is trying to do some minor modifications in those sections to improve that. And last year there was a talk, I believe it's, it's a similar talk that uh, Darren's going to give us here in a few moments, but it's looking at those minor modifications at Bradford Island, which are similar to what we did at Washington Shore. And so we'll let Darren get into the details on that. He's also with the Portland District Fish Field Unit and works with Nathan and, and those folks. So with that, Darren. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, I just want to recognize uh, my co-authors up here, uh, Patricia Madsen, Devin McKenna, Stephen Sachs, Kristen Bailey, and Nathan Zorich. Uh, put a lot of effort into uh, getting the job done this year. Um, so as you've seen, there's uh, concerns over uh, passage of lamprey at Bonneville Dam. Estimates put it around 50%. Um, so in hopes to improve lamprey passage, uh, these orifices were installed at both Washington Shore in 2017 and at Bradford Island in 2018. I think we can figure out the pointer here. So that's uh, the orifice is uh, 16 inches wide and an inch and a half tall. And there's some concern that some onids would uh, be negatively impacted by the installation of these. And so our objectives were to monitor some onid approach and interaction with the orifices and report uh, that relative to the, the fish window counts um, and also to monitor uh, lamprey use of these orifices. Our study area this year was at Bradford Island. Um, just to give you some orientation, the fishway exit is here. A couple hundred feet downstream, there's uh, weirs three and five of the serpentine section. And the fish count window is down here. So we monitored uh, orifices that were installed at Bradford Island at weirs three and five. Um, and we, you might notice we did not monitor uh, or install an orifice at Weir 1. That's uh, because of the results we found at Washington Shore last year that suggested over 90% of the salmonid approaches and interactions took place at that orifice. And we had actually a net uh, negative downstream movement of, of lamprey at that location. We think it's because of the slow velocities uh, that are associated with that area. Our equipment uh, was uh, two underwater cameras, one overhead and one to the side. Um, we added this camera at Bradford Island this year to help us identify species of salmonids. Uh, the overhead uh, camera wasn't, wasn't quite cutting it for that. Um, you also notice the infrared light that we had there. And this is uh, the downstream side of the, the orifice. Uh, that information was fed into the DVR and recorded. On the upstream side of the orifice, we also added a camera to better enumerate uh, lamprey passage through the orifices. So our sample periods, we had uh, one to two week uh, sample periods during May, June, August, and September. Typically, we monitored some onids from uh, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m and lamprey from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., with a couple of exceptions during May there. Um, and then we uh, enumerated lamprey passage seven nights during June when the kind of the peak of the run was, two nights in August and two nights in September. This image just gives you an idea of what an approach and what an interaction looks like. Uh, the fish on the left, you know, approached the orifice but didn't actually make contact with it. The fish on the right nosed in and, and made contact with the uh, orifice surface. So, as I said, we added a camera to help us identify species of salmon. We were able to do that um, during all months except September. And during September, we had coho, chinook, and steelhead present, and this image just lets you uh, get an idea how difficult it can be to determine the difference between coho and chinook. So during uh, September, we similar to what we did at Washington Shore last year, we just took the, the number of approaches and interactions 
and uh, took the proportion of some audits observed at the, the windows and extrapolated that to, oops, to uh, the number of Chinook steelhead and coho during September. So the percent of run that passed Bradford Island while we were uh, uh, monitoring with video ranged between 10 and 37 percent. So we think we got a pretty good uh, a sample, representative sample. And I've included this video just to uh, show you what an approach and interaction looks like. And the left camera is the side view that helps identify a fish. And it looks a little better on my computer screen, but <laughs> uh, you could see, uh, uh, you know, that was a steelhead with the, the blush side and the stripe and, uh, and the spawning pattern. So results for uh, some honored approaches and interactions. Uh, overall, we had you know a relatively small uh, uh, proportion of the run that approached uh, around three percent or less, and typically about a half a percent or less that uh, interacted with other than sockeye, which was up around one point three percent. We had a uh, uh, mean approach time of two point eight seconds and an interaction time of 7.5 seconds. Comparing our data from uh, at Bradford Island during 2018 with the Washington Shore data in 2017, we see that we had a uh, decrease in, in the number of interactions from 0.8 to 0.5 percent. And I think that's primarily due to the uh, lack of installation of a, a orifice at that first weir. You would kind of expect that to see that same relationship here uh, with a number of approaches. Um, that didn't show up, and I think that's primarily because I think we did a better job of capturing more subtle approaches, fish that didn't actually turn sideways and approach the orifice, but fish that moved vertically in the water column uh, from the top to the bottom or, you know, side slipped kind of towards the orifice but didn't actually turn in. But it was still apparent that they were approaching the orifice. The other thing you might notice here is that sockeye increased in the number of approaches and in interactions, and summer chinook and steelhead, which all these occur. Not sure what that was about. Uh, all these occur uh, during June when we were able to ID to species. So I think what's happening basically is at Bradford Island we were able to identify sockeye that. At Washington Shore, we're um, just, uh, we use the proportion of window counts to estimate those. So results of our comparison between the weirs, this is at Bradford Island 2018 data. Uh, we had a uh, majority of the fish that approached or interacted, 55% or 54% in 66. At weir three versus weir five, which was less, we had almost two to one uh, ratio of interactions at weir three. And again, I think that's because of the slower velocities that are present there. This was at Washington Shore. This was about a half foot per second, and uh, I think we measured 1.3 feet per second here, and uh, about twice that. I think 3.4 feet per second. So, I'm not sure why that keeps clicking there. Sorry. You can see in the turbulence uh, in this picture that there are slower velocities at weir three. So I, I think that's why we're seeing um, a higher percentage of approaches and interactions there. It's just allowing the fish to meander more. So comparing them back to our Washington data, again, we did not install um, an orifice at Weir 1, where most of the approaches and interactions took place. Uh, but when you, if you just eliminate that row and, and look at Weirs 3 and 5, we kind of see the same ratio where we have a 3 to 2 ratio between approaches and interactions. So as far as lamprey passage goes, um, at Washington Shore last year we had 
uh, you know, this is kind of what we were looking at. We only had a downstream uh, angle on the fish, so it made enumerating uh, a lot more difficult and time consuming. This year, at, we added the upstream pass it, or upstream cameras, it was a lot easier to see what was going on. So results from our Ampere Passage uh, estimates. We still had a lot of downstream movement here, um, you know, several thousand fish moving downstream, but we did have a net upstream movement and a, a fair number of fish. We had 3,300 at Weir 5 and 2,600 at Weir 3. In relation to window counts, that's 112% of what they counted at the window during the same time period and 87%. And I think the reason why, the main reason why this is more than what we counted at the window is, as other researchers have suggested, there's uh, you know, a fair amount of recycling going on here. So they're probably just getting flushed down through the, the uh, vertical slot weir and then passing up through the orifice as we count them. Comparing uh, Bradford Island to Washington Shore, um, again, it's just a large percentage during both studies that uh, uh, passed through the orifice in comparison to the window counts. And again, we got rid of that first weir where we had a negative uh, actual downstream, net downstream movement um, at Washington Shore. So in summary, 2% uh, of some islands approached the orifices. Uh, and a half percent uh, interacted at Bradford Island. And our results were similar to those what we saw in 2017 at Washington Shore. Um, monitoring passage at the orifice at exit for lamprey was a lot more efficient and accurate. Removing the orifice at where one eliminated the net downstream movement uh, at that location. More than 87% of the window passage passed upstream through weirs three and five and some of the Washington Shore, we had a high percentage of lamprey use. In the future, um, you know, the idea is if this has a minimal impact on some monads and improves beneficial for, for lamprey, we just continue cutting those slots up through the, the rest of the ladder. So there may be some monitoring required for that. And additionally, uh, there's been some interest in the rest boxes that were pictured there, um, looking at some monad interactions with those. And with that, I'll open it up. Questions for Darren? <clears throat> Darren, I, I see the importance of your work. I wonder, uh, you've got quite a bit of a gear out there. I wonder if you've thought about doing a control for just a uh, camera set up without an orifice. Yeah, we did not monitor that. That's something that uh, Nathan had suggested in the past. Um, the, the gear does get pulled, uh, you know, when it's not being used to record video, so it's not in the fish way all the time. But yeah, we didn't, we didn't account for, um, you know, how much effect that gear might have on fish approaches. Other questions? All right, thank you.